I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. Welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We're um, taping today in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as unceded indigenous land. It's Tuesday, February 6th, and we're ready to go. Let's hear from Keith first. Well, and first, welcome back. Thank, oh, you. thank you. We had you, a lovely look, time in, New, in California. I was going to say you look rested, but not necessarily that tan. So. No, it was a little chilly, but it was fun. <laughs> well, it was chilly at night mostly. It was warm in the day and then cold at night. It was the desert. Well, welcome back to where cold you. is cold. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, it's all relative. So starting with trivia, front page, Outs in the Mountains. February 1999, and this was an immemorial tribute to an LGBTQ plus leader who had lived here in Vermont. And this is someone who had established an ongoing organization connecting older lesbians with each other and dedicated to helping women overcome loneliness. And they received a Lifetime Achievement Award from SAGE <clears throat> and a hint they might have been one of the plenary speakers at the first statewide town hall meeting sponsored for the LGBTQ plus community. And Rachel, I'm counting on you to get this one. <laughs> so I want to start with a brief in memoria current. And this is for Larry Kessler, who passed over on February 1st. And Larry Kessler was the founder of AIDS Action of Massachusetts in Boston in 1983 and has a personal connection with us because when we were first forming Vermont Cares here in Vermont and putting together a service package and how to do outreach, work with our Department of Health, Larry Kessler provided us with counsel advice and would always show up to help do trainings and conferences to advance care and treatment for people living with HIV and AIDS. He was also one of the founding board members of the National AIDS Council and the Presidential Commission on AIDS. And in the notice, it acknowledged that it was his actions that started the first statewide AIDS hotline in Massachusetts secured Medicaid funding for low-income people with HIV, lobbied for safe needle exchange programs, instituted the annual AIDS walk. He was the one that went after the transit system in Boston when they refused to put up the condom ads, and he won. <coughs> so thank you, and safe journey. So looking at events, because Orca may have something to do with that, you may want to put on your calendars the Green Mountain Film Festival, March 14th through the 17th. And what we have been told is that there may be a very queer look ah! to some of the offerings. So stay tuned, we will be telling you more. But in our ongoing acknowledgement of events, Typewriters, dollhouses, dogs, descendants, <laughs> Diane Fitch. Yes. Her paintings and drawings at the gallery at the Highland Center for the Arts, and this is through the 11th. So Coming right up. You better get there. This will be our last promotion. And let me just say, we were able to go to the opening, and Diane gave a brilliant artist talk. That was wonderful. Really. It was really, it knocked your socks off. So at Rainbow Umbrella, we've got the women's discussion group, book discussion group. Go on the Facebook page, find out what they're reading, and get on to Ann's distribution list to find out what they're talking about. It's very interesting. Highland, uh, higher Ground, Saturday, the 17th, starting at 7.30, Apocalypstic. <laughs> It could only be the House of LeMay's Winter is a Drag. Go on Higher Ground website for ticket information. So Fox Market, also on Saturday the 17th, they're doing a live music and an open mic acoustic queer 
guitar music, mm. which means bring your guitar, serenade us. Your ukulele. Whatever. And then on Saturday the 27th, starting at 7 p.m. as well, is queer poetry reading. Yeah. And it's open. I'm Anyone there. can come. Pride Center of Vermont on Monday the 12th. Crown Care. This is free haircuts, gender affirming for the queer BIPOC community. Uh -huh. We had reported on the last show about the Queer Act, which is about non-discrimination based on hairstyles that may be cultural, ethnic, racially connected, and there's a bill going through in Vermont on that. All right. Social tinkering on Wednesday the 28th is their monthly social gathering. And this is going to be starting at 6 p.m. at the Vermont Farmers Food Center on West Street. Also in Rutland, and we haven't talked about them for a while, but Merchants Hall, they're still doing their monthly drag shows. Wow, that's so been a while. Get that on your calendar. <clears throat> okay. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right. And then I'll come back and depress you with news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's my a lot job. of it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, on the top of our list is, and not necessarily the most important, is a restaurant and bar in Philadelphia said the quiet part out loud last week when they posted a Craigslist ad seeking a new bartender for a gay neighborhood mainstay. Must be biologically male, <gasps> read the ad, for a male bartender center, City, Philadelphia at Moriarty's Restaurant and Bar. The listing was posted January 24th, according to the Philadelphia Inquirer, but has since been taken down. Good. So We've got to do better. From our own. We've you know. got to do better. Yeah. <clears throat> Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican of Louisiana, our favorite, one of our favorite people, <laughs> recently appeared at a summit at the anti-LGBT yeah. group hate group alongside Jonathan Kahn, a pastor who blames ancient gods and demons for furthering the LGBTQ rights movement. The men's appearance coincided with a report detailing Johnson's list to Christian dominionism, a movement that sees the U.S. as a Christian nation <coughs> that must be governed by biblical law. Johnson and Kane both attended the Family Research Council's National Gathering for Prayer and Representants on Wednesday. The Southern Love Poverty Law Center reported FC, FRC and SPLC designated hate groups. So. I, I can verify that from personal experience. <clears throat> oh, God. The 10 Republican Oregon state senators who walked out of the legislature I love this story. for six weeks last year can't run for re-election. <laughs> and why? Because the Supreme <laughs> Court ruled it this week. The senators <coughs> have walked out to stall progress on hundreds of bills, <coughs> excuse me, including ones on transgender health care, abortion, and firearm <coughs> reform. This is the Oregon Supreme Court. Right. <coughs> excuse me. Last year, Oregon's Secretary of State ruled that the senators weren't allowed to run for re-election due to Measure 113, a 2022 voter-approved law that disqualifies legislators <laughs> with more than 10 ab ab absentees from being re-elected after their current term ends. Isn't, oh. that, isn't that nice? And I think only one is approving it. Yep. But they're going to say they, they're saying they're going to run again after, you know, the next term I where they can't know. run. Well, you know. Okay. Ha. ha. We'll see. you got to get elected. A yeah. Pennsylvania man was arrested Tuesday and charged with murder after he posted a deranged rant, including an attack on an LBGTQ community online while holding his father's severed head. <gasps> I know. Oh, my God. An NBC News reports 32-year-old Justin Moan is accused of killing his 68-year-old father, Michael Moyne. <coughs> the subject's mother, Dennis Moyne, Denise Moyne, called police after returning home Tuesday evening to find her husband's body in a blood-spattered bathroom and her son missing. So 
There you go for that, huh? Wow. Mm. I don't even know if his father was, I don't know. A New York pizzeria has agreed to pay $25,000 to a trans former employee who says he was repeatedly harassed while working there. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission sued upstate New York T.C. Wheeler's Bar and Pizzeria on behalf of the trans man, Quinn Gambino, who was a cook at the restaurant. You know where the event occurred? In Buffalo? In Tonawanda. Tonawanda? I know. My family has a history in Tonawanda. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Not with this company, though. <laughs> no, certainly not. Conservative, conservative podcaster and Turning Point USA founder Charlie Kirk discussed a hypothetical situation related to the January 6th insurrection. If the insurrection had started a gay orgy instead of vandalizing the Capitol, attempting to kill elected officials and beating police officers, none of them would have been prosecuted. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, I have an, Ann and I have been watching Truman Capote. The, the swans. swans. Oh. And I have a clip here of the series that's going on now on Hulu. And if you get a chance, give it a look. It's pretty fun and kind of twisted. Totally twisted. <laughs> but, you know, interesting. Um, so here it is. Hello, ladies. Mind if I sit down? Oh, I wish you could, but we're being joined in just a second. We made New York the capital of the world, the center of everything. And who is at the center of that center? Truman. Truman. Truman Capote is our great protector and our best friend. We tell him everything, even the awful things we've all done to each other. You earn the face you deserve. Yes, I think so. Oh, my. Yeah. Truman. These ladies are swans. Why did you write about them? Because they are beautiful and predatory. Why can't it be everything all at once? Sex, money, and an endless invention. <laughs> that perfume she wears, too much for a woman with her face. And the stories one hears with secrets and lies. It's the best thing I've written. You have to pull this. These are portraits of those who have shared their deepest secrets with you. Why would you want to hurt them? This is what a writer does. This is bloody and true and real. Those are your friends you splayed out on those magazine pages. His portrait of us is everywhere. He's telling everyone about our secret life. You miserable little. What are you going to do? We destroy him. And is this what you wanted? To be vilified and banished? He's finished. <laughs> You told more lies. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So you both give it a thumbs up. I'm enjoying it a lot. It's so twisted, though. Anne I don't says know. it's so twisted, it's really hard to... Okay. But, you know, I liked it a lot. I think, you know, it, it sort of gives a... You know, it's, it's true. It's what happened. Um, and, okay. you know... It's not a good presentation of Truman. No, but we all sort of know he was a little... Snake in the grass. Moving on. <laughs> so I have one more before we move on to Anne. After a well-received season of Feud... Bet and Joan FX is bringing back this Ryan Murphy anthology this series. This one we were just talking about. Right. Oh, oh, yeah, this one, yeah. Oh, this must be my synopsis of the movie, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Never mind then. Anyway. Well, you could read the synopsis. <laughs> or not. Um, so anyway, uh, Bet. Oh, this, no. This was the one that was before this. It was called oh. Feud. Right. The one that was before the new one that's on now. Which is also called Feud. But it's the Swans. Right. Right. So. So it's a well time honored theme. Yes. And you know. Somebody um, wrote it. Yeah. A book about it. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And the Swans 
Uh, I can't remember, but Jackie Kennedy's sister. Lee Radswell. Yeah. And um, the governor. Babe Paley. Yes, the, she was the um, the wife of the mayor of New York, right? And the governor. Governor of New York. Rockefeller. No, happy Rockefeller's Rock wife. Yeah, well, this is, we're in the woods with this, but yeah. Happy Rockefeller slept with William Paley, who was the head of CBS, while he was married to this Babe Paley, whom uh, Truman Capote kind of romanced in a uh, platonic way and then betrayed. So betrayal is big in this series. Yeah, because you really cared, or cared for him. And he wrote an expose. About all of them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. The Campaign for Southern Equality has filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education and Justice saying new North Carolina laws are creating a hostile environment for LGBTQ students. The complaint addresses two laws passed last year through legislature, legislators override of Democratic Governor Roy Cooper's veto. Senate Bill 49, characterized by its supporters as a parents' rights bill, we've all heard that, mm -hmm. limits instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity in public schools and forces staffers to go out, forces staffers and transgender students to out transgender students to their parents. House Bill 574 bans trans girls and women from participating in female sports in public schools and some private ones, plus both police and private in both public and private colleges. So you know, it's really because North Carolina is like <clears throat> Uh, pretty 50-50 state, and when they got to elect a governor, they elected a Democrat. But it's so gerrymandered mm -hmm. that, you know, they can't get uh, enough Democrats in their state legislature. So, anyway. Well, I read that they're rolling back their anti-transgender bathroom bills and Good. that sort of stuff. Yeah. Good. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, shall I... Yes, please do. Let's talk about the world. No. Sort of. <laughs> uh, I'd like to show you a picture of transgender swimmer Leah Thomas, who has mounted a legal challenge against world aquatics. Um, she's been quietly mounting this legal battle against world aquatics to overturn the swimming governing body's effective ban on most trans women from competing in the highest levels of the sport. Um, According to the new uh, guidelines issued in June 2022, um, trans women are prohibited from competing in women's swimming events unless they transition before age 12, which is very few people. Um, details were have not been made public because uh, they're supposed to be kept confidential but before the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Um, so <clears throat> there was some backlash when Thomas made global headlines for her NCAA win and became the face and often a conservative <clears throat> and often conservative media's punching bag of the worldwide debate over whether trans women should compete in women's sports. Um, in May 2022, she told ABC News' Good Morning America that it's been a lifelong goal of hers to compete in the Olympics. Uh, her lawyer confirmed that uh, the rules imposed by World Aquatics are discriminatory, and um, the lawyer said they cause profound harm to trans women. Um, the legal challenge occurred, the Court of Arbitration for Sport <coughs> confirmed that the, um, that the uh, challenge has been filed. And <clears throat> it also noted that cases are normally dealt with in private, but that legal parties involved in Thomas's case agreed that general information concerning the procedure itself might be communicated by the court office. A hearing has not been scheduled, but she's uh, challenging that, which is good. Yeah. Um, now let's look at a picture at, of Huang Ji, 
who is Taiwan's first openly gay lawmaker. And there's an article about her about how she overcame criticism about age experience and sexual orientation. After overcoming anti-LGBTQ discrimination, skepticism about her age, and criticism of her limited political experience, 31-year-old Huang Ji says her election to Taiwan's parliament as the island's first openly gay MP represents Great. progress, which it is. Now we know that democratic Taiwan is one of the most liberal societies in Asia and hailed as a bastion for LGBTQ rights as the region's first to legalize same-sex marriage in 2019. That must really piss off the Chinese, huh? Mm -hmm. I hope <laughs> it does. I hope my election will bring courage to many people as I've demonstrated I've done it standing on the front line, she said. She's going to be sworn in on Thursday. She entered politics in 2018 when she was elected to the city council on a small new power, new power party ticket. I like the sound of that group. She quit the party and successfully ran for re-election as an independent city council in 2022. After joining the Progressive Party last August, she enlisted to replace an incumbent lawmaker. I had only 70 days to campaign. I was not running in my own constituency, and there were questions about my young age and with the fact that I've only been in politics five years. Some political <clears throat> commentators thought she wouldn't win because of her sexual orientation, as there are some church and anti-gay groups in her constituency. However, she did not emphasize her sexual orientation during the campaign um, and notes that there have been a few openly gay politicians elected at municipal levels. Calling her win a positive outcome, she believes her election reflects certain progress in Taiwan society, but it's not always been smooth sailing since she embarked on her political career at age 25. Um, she was a target of constant attacks in 2021, but she managed to survive a vote to oust her from the city council. So they went after her. Uh, but the groups that launched the recall distributed flyers to vilify and mock me. Online comments were even more extreme, <coughs> such as being gay is like being mentally ill. That's a familiar trope. Uh, yeah, for her really. legislative campaign, criticism about her sexual identity remained largely in the Internet echo chamber. So she's the youngest lawmaker elected to this parliament. Her priorities are promoting gender equality and human rights as well as speaking out about generational and distributional justice for young people who feel, feel deprived due to low wages and a widening wealth gap. Nice. So that's good news. Yeah. Now, um, Any more? That was my Asian <laughs> news, and now I have South American news. Which Only is usually very depressing. And <laughs> this proves to, proves to be the case. It proves to be the case in this instance. Now I'd like to show you a picture, picture of Brent Sikima, uh, who was stabbed in Rio, um, and robbery is the motive. Uh, he, was, he's a, he was a New York City art dealer, and a 30-year-old man has been arrested on January 18th for his alleged role in the stabbing murder of Sikima. Uh, a prominent art dealer in New York who was found dead in Rio, his home in Rio, on January 16th. Alejandro Triana Trevez of Cuba was taken into custody by police at a gas station um, hundreds of miles northwest of Rio. Authorities are investigating the case as a robbery. Sakima 75 founded the Sakima Jenkins and Company Art Gallery and was last seen on surveillance video when he arrived home shortly after 4.30 on January 13th. And then uh, surveillance video has revealed that this um, alleged perpetrator waited in his car for half the day and then cased the neighborhood and then waited a few more hours. So finally uh, broke into the house or entered the house at 3.30 in the morning. So they must have had surveillance cameras out there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Authorities said he had $3,000 with him at the time of his arrest, and it is believed that he stole that from Sakima's home. Initial findings indicate that Treves came from Sao Paulo specifically to commit this crime, uh, said the detective with the Rio State Police's homicide unit. He then returned to Sao Paulo, leading investigators to believe he had some kind of privileged information. His business par partners posted a note on Sakima and Jenkins' website acknowledging his death. It is with great sadness that the, gal the gallery announced the passing of our beloved founder, Brett Brent Sakima, states the note which the staff signed. Sakima was raised in Morrison, Illinois, graduated from the San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, he went on to work as the director of exhibitions at the Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester before heading to Boston in 1976 to serve as the director of Vision Gallery. He moved to New York City in 1991 and launched Worcester Gardens, a Soho-based contemporary art gallery. The gallery relocated to Chelsea in 1999, and several years later it was renamed to Sakima Jenkins and Company, according to the partners. Multiple reports say Sakima is survived by his husband and 12-year-old son, but there are very few details about wow. his personal life. Now, I can go to Europe. I you have... think they would have known there were security cameras? And why, you know, it doesn't reveal why this, why he was stalking this particular person, whether they had yeah. prior connection or what. There are times when security camera doesn't make a difference if you think your actions are justified and you will get away with it. <laughs> well, he must have thought they he would, would get away with it. Absolutely. Well, so, shall I continue? Mm -hmm. Okay. One well, more story, then we'll move on to Keith. Okay, this involves a clip and the Sundance. Festival, which just aired, the 2020, 2024 Sundance uh, Festival just occurred. And uh, this is aired there, and unfortunately, I can't tell you where it's going to be shown, but keep your eyes out for it. It's called Layla, a 2024 British romance film written and directed by Amru Al Qadi in their feature directorial debut. The plot is short, and the clip is going to be short. While navigating their identity around friends and family, Layla, a non-binary British-Palestinian drag queen living in London, falls in love with Max, an advertising executive. But there's more to it. So let's look at a clip from Layla. <laughs> right, time to skin your bitch. It's literally a noodle needle <laughs> up my hole. <laughs> Move, man. Give it Layla bolognese. Oh, yeah, she listened to me. Yes, you're going to be looking good. <laughs> Ready. Is that party invite still going? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. are just in time for the best part. Mm -hmm. This is where you get to see behind the curtain. Enter Mr. Darcy. Wow, that's what a production. <laughs> Somebody's laying pipe tonight. <laughs> oh, come on, sit down. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. What do you think? Of this. Oh, it's unreal, babe. Oh, yes, honey, this eats, but this devours. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to a sort of like an alien themed party. Uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you couldn't look more human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you thought that was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's giving very corporate realness, honey. Here. Oh, perfect. Do you mind? What? Stabbing me? <laughs> no, I'd never. All right. Looks and stay interesting. tuned for updates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keith. So on our next show, I'm going to be talking about some of the mischief going on in New Hampshire with a lot of anti-LGBTQ, <clears throat> specifically anti-trans legislation going through. And also we'll be talking about Alberta, Canada, and how it seems to be following Saskatchewan and New Brunswick with very hostile anti-trans policies. But first I want to start with the follow-up on Maine. And on a, the last show we talked about LD1735, <coughs> which is a bill that would essentially create Maine as a sanctuary state for transgender youth, transgender people. What has been reported recently is that this bill was voted down unanimously in their House Judiciary, but there are mixed media reports. 
su such so that a quality main issued a statement saying, before you rush to judgment, this action was not the result of the alt-right's rabid campaign. This was not in response to their saying, the state of Maine wants to take your children away from you. What Equality Maine says is that this bill, as it was being debated in their House Judiciary, was radically different than what had been introduced. It was radically different than what had been presented at public hearings, and that Equality Maine and our community activists had problems with this bill from the beginning. This bill was voted down because of a lack of transparency in the transitions of the bill, and because it wasn't following the due process, what they were voting on is not what people commented on in a public hearing. So this actually is good <coughs> governance, despite how it appears on the surface. But we will be following up because they're working already on a new bill. So looking at Vermont, and we've got a lot going on now, first thing I want to highlight is we've got another constitutional amendment. Oh. And this is Proposition 4. It is already in the Senate Judiciary. It has 23 Senate co-sponsors. There's only 30 members of the mm -hmm. Senate. So there's their two-thirds to begin with. What this would do is to amend the Constitution to say the government must not deny equal treatment and respect under the law on account of a person's race, ethnicity, sex, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or national origin. This would expand upon existing language within chapter one that describes all people as being born equally free and independent. This is directly in response to the current trend happening on a national level and current US Supreme Court rulings. Uh -huh. um, the US Constitution's 14th Amendment all, already includes an equal protection clause, but Reverend Mark Hughes, who we know <coughs> from the Vermont Racial Justice, told the judiciary, Proposal 4 is urgently needed to advance protections to every resident in Vermont given emerging federal challenges. Yes. Dick Sears, who is the chair of Senate Judiciary and would be the first hurdle to overcome, said, this is going to be a priority. Oh. There's a great deal of support. And in light of US Supreme Court rulings regarding the 14th Amendment, I think it would be important to try and get a statement of equal rights into the Vermont Constitution. Vermont Law School professor Peter Teachout, who is a frequent consultor and constitutional law scholar, told the, told the committee that an equal protection clause is important for the simple reason there isn't one now. Thank Good. you. Do states over, what if the Supreme Court says one thing? Does the state still have state rights as far as that's concerned? You, you would have to work that out. The federal would always trump the state, but the state is putting a statement in place saying this is how we will govern. Okay. You can make something more liberal than the federal, but you couldn't make it more restrictive. So. Okay. Well, there, 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 there would be a balance. Yeah. And they would be looking again. So what we're also looking at is the House Education Committee. They're doing a joint hearing with the Senate on... Um, <coughs> education funding and thinking about what may be happening with property taxes and all of the other issues about changing how Vermont does education funding. This is going to be a huge issue. But they're also about to look at getting the work group report about harassment in schools. And unfortunately, the report is not being presented until the day after we tape, so I could not read it in advance. But I'm going to, we will be looking to see how it talks about bullying, harassment of LGBTQ plus youth, and if there are specific recommendations they're making. 
but they're also going to be hearing from their general counsel on how they approve independent schools oh. and think about the lawsuits that are cur have currently been happening where the Alliance Defending Freedom challenging what restrictions that can be put in place. And associated with that, what was reported recently is the Woodstock School District reached a settlement with their snowboard instructor who had been fired for making a anti-trans athlete's statement. The settlement doesn't mention a dollar amount, but the Alliance Defending Freedom is already saying this is a win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it upholds, you know, his freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And this is a case that was a little a little different than the ordinary. They were at a tournament. They were playing, they were competing with a team that had a transgender athlete on their women's team. In a private conversation, he made a comment that he didn't agree, that it was his belief that biology at birth is set. That's it. It doesn't change. And it was reported to the school, to the superintendent. He was subsequently fired. What the suit alleged is it was a private conversation. It was freedom of speech. It wasn't a public conversation. And then the issue becomes he was a coach at a tournament. Was it really private conversation? Speech. Yeah. He was a coach presenting an opinion in you know private conversation. It was still a public forum. So but this is again one of those cases that the members of the school board said that the person, the attorney representing their insurance company mm -hmm. recommended the settlement because it would cost less yeah. than the cost That's of what litigation, happens all the time. which means there's no decision. Right. It isn't the actions they took were within the limits of the Vermont Principals Association or no, 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 you, you went too far. It's, we, we don't want to have to deal with this, so we're paying you to go away. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, and, oh, one brief, before I forget, I'm sorry. Our House and Senate have issued a joint statement that was signed by 117 state and federal lawmakers identifying the increase in homophobic acts. Mm -hmm saying that they're concerned about the surge in hate crimes. They specifically cited the incident in Isle Lamont and in White River Junction with the bomb threat at Dry Queen Story Hours. They were saying these incidents are not isolated. They reflect a disturbing pattern of increasing LGBT plus hatred across the country. Mike Pichek went on to say, we like to believe that Vermont is a sanctuary. We really need to acknowledge we're not were subject to. Of note, all leadership, House and Senate, signed on to this bill. There's representatives from all parties Good. that are part of it. And every elected statewide official in our entire congressional delegation signed on to this. Good. 117 is significant. So, Go Vermont. Yep. LGBTQ advocates in Washington state are outraged after a string of inspections over a weekend included LGBTQ establishments that were cited for how patrons were dressed. Two popular gay leather bars in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood faced unexpected scrutiny from authorities on Friday and Saturday evening, leading to a wave of um, outrage within the LGBT community. The Cuff Complex and the Seattle Eagle were subjected, subjected to the owners described as raids, resulting in lewd conduct violations over patrons' clothing choices. Here's a picture. There was some, like a nipple, someone had a nipple showing or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. 
Uh, we're we're going to have to be careful. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Authorities in Georgia are investigating an arson fire that happened last year as an LGBTQ hate crime. Um, in three years, President Joe Biden's nomination have helped to bring broader diversity to the federal judiciary, a body that has long been dominated by white cisgender men. Now Biden and Senate Democrats are poised to uh, tie a record for confirmations of LGBTQ judges. If the state approves Judge Nicole Berner and Melissa Du Bois, Biden will tie with for, will tie with former President Barack Obama's record for appointing eleven open LGBT uh, lifetime judges to the federal bench. These confirmations would come at a time when more LGBTQ rights cases are being fought in courts across the country and even making their way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And here is a picture of the two judges who were nominated. And not to forget, our Beth Robinson is one of those appointed sure. lifetime judges. Yes. So. Um, a San Francisco man was convicted by a jury on Tuesday for a group, oh, they, I, let me see, oh, Gerald Rowe, 52, was convicted for a first-degree murder, torture, and poisoned, and poisoning of George Russell, um, Saldivine, Saldivar, 23, in Market Street Hotel Room, February 3rd, 2019. Rowe and his accomplice... Angel Anderson, 41, engaged in a consensual threesome with Radcliffe Salvador before they raped and tortured him over for four hours, injected him with fentanyl, strangled him, and stuffed him alive in a suitcase, which they dumped in the San Francisco Bay. Oh, my God. I know. Your stories get just more in keeping with your horror <laughs> film <laughs> obsession. <laughs> Well, Coleman Domenico, oh, no. who just received an Oscar nomination for playing civil rights activist Bayard, Bayard, Bayard Rustin, Bayard Rustin, in the biopic Rustin, has been announced for two more film roles as real life figures: iconic singer and actor Nat King Cole, and Jackson family patriarch Joe Jackson. Domenico will also direct and co-write the Cole biopic. He told Variety, it will be the first feature film as a director. Um, <clears throat> I think it's biopic. Is it biopic? All right. Well, I always pronounced it biopic, but you know, <laughs> you know, I'm not getting in the middle of this one. <laughs> <clears throat> Before Nick Peg Pegano passed away from a fentanyl overdose in July 2021. He told his parents he wanted to become a social worker for LGBTQ people. Today, Rich Padago is honoring his son's legacy with a benefit concert that will help LGBTQ pay for additional treatment. Through the nonprofit Release Recovery Foundation, proceeds, proceeds from the show will go to fund Nick's name to be given back to those in need of assistance. That was good news, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> the campaign for Southern Equality Office in Asheville, North Carolina, was broken into over the weekend, with a burglar taking the LGBTQ pro nonprofit safe. The incident occurred Saturday morning around 4.30 a.m. at the CSE's local office space in the basement of the First Congregational Church. The organization said that the church security camera footage showed one person take their safe, which included a small amount of cash and several undeposited checks. You know, so many people have video cameras now. I'm really surprised that... Um, and... Um, I want to, I'm going to miss a lot of stories, but um, I wanted to uh, talk about Ann McGuire, and, um, and, and she died, and she was a Massachusetts activist who co-hosted a gay radio show in the 1970s, advocated for LGBTQ rights and breast cancer research. She worked 
for groundbreaking political candidates, and she died at age 80. She was well-known political organizer in 74. She managed lesbian Elaine Noble's first campaign for Massachusetts mm -hmm. House, and Noble won, becoming the first out LGBTQ person elected to any state legislature in the United States. She worked for straight allies as well, running Thomas Menino's first campaign for Boston mayor in 93. He also won and then put her in charge of the city's health and human services. That's so. I remember talking to her at Women's Week in Provincetown a couple of years ago. She moved to Provincetown. And she was most you know, known to the, uh, the Boston populace as yeah. the proprietor and owner of somewhere. Yes. That then became somewhere else. She was really a, a larger than life figure. I know, and I, I remember going to somewhere else and everybody would say, Ann McGuire, Ann yeah, McGuire. She, I can see her now. And I'm just going to say one more thing, and then I'm going to pass it on to Ann about Roberta Kaplan, the lawyer who rep represented E. Jean Carroll in her sexual abuse and defamation lawsuit. Uh, against Donald Trump is a lesbian who's a longtime champion of LGBT uh, and women's rights, most notably as the attorney who brought down the main part of the Defense of Marriage Act. A jury in federal court in New York City reached a verdict in May in Carroll's sexual abuse suit, which stemmed from an incident in the mid-1990s. Carroll, a journalist, said that Trump raped her in the Bergdorf Goodman department store in Manhattan and that he defamed her by saying she was lying about it. So, good for her. Good for both of them. Yes. Okay, and I'm missing a lot of, of uh, news, but I'll have to get to them another time. Well, let's start out on a bad note. Um, I have a picture before you now, and I don't usually show perpetrators, but these are the two teenagers who killed the trans girl, Brianna oh. Gay, and they've been sentenced to life in prison. Um, Scarlett Jenkinson and Eddie Radcliffe, who were 15 at the time of the killing and are now 16, received sentences from Justin and Amanda Yip Friday, the BBC reports. They were convicted of murder uh, December 20th. They had pleaded not guilty, each blamed the other, and of course I've told you all about this. But a jury found them both responsible their names had not been released, but now the confidentiality order has been lifted. Gay, 16, died after being stabbed 28 times in a, a park village. Um, Jed, uh, Jenkinson and Radcliffe were arrested a few days later. They committed a brutal and planned murder, which was sadistic in nature, the judge said, sentencing them. They will be eligible for parole only if it's determined that they no longer pose a danger to society. Oh. Jenkinson had a deep desire to kill, the judge said, while Radcliffe was motivated by bigotry against trans people. He wrote transphobic and dehumanizing messages and undoubtedly displayed hostility to Brianna based on her transgender identity. Oh. Jenkinson, as I reported in the past, masterminded the crime but it would be wholly wrong to treat Radcliffe as being under Scarlett's control. Brianna's family read a victim impact statement before the sentencing. Esther Gay said Jen, Jen, Jenkinson and Radcliffe always pose, will always pose a danger to society, adding, I would never want them to have the opportunity to carry out their sadistic fantasies on another child. Their family, everybody's families were there Jenkinson's mother could be seen weeping at the end, but her family gave a statement to the Warrington Guardian apologizing, this is the family of Jenkinson, to Brianna's loved ones and saying, all of our thoughts are for Brianna and her family. They thanked Esther Gay for her selflessness and empathy and said they found the sentence appropriate, along with the decision to identify uh, Jenkinson and Radcliffe. So the oh. families agreed. <clears throat> On a more upbeat note, a new sculpture celebrates Alan Turing at the University of Cambridge. And let's look at a picture of it. I saw that. Um, it's been unveiled at King's College. 
Turing, the Bletchley Park codebreaker, played a crucial role, as I'm sure you all know, uh, in the that Allies' was an victory. Picture. I mean, sculpture. Yeah, over. Uh, so he um, played a crucial role in the Allies' victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. He studied at King's College from 1931 to 34 and was elected a fellow there in 1935. The work by Sir Anthony Gormley, best known for the Angel of the North, stands at 12 feet, 12.1 feet tall. <laughs> He said the sculpture was not a, a memorialization of a death, but about celebration of the opportunities that life allowed. Sculpture was made from a material that he often uses. It contains 1% of copper, which means it will oxidize over time, forming a rich red rust nice. surface. Ooh. Mm -hmm. The sculpture's relationship with time and weather is an integral part of its character. The provost of King's College praised the artwork for reflecting both Turing's brilliance and his vulnerability. At the same time, the sculpture also embodies the transformation of the industrial into the information age, she said. On, on August 2022, the historic England told um, Cambridge City Council's planning committee that the sculpture would be far more visible than the proposals implied and would cause some harm to the significance of the historic college. However, it was approved uh, and the college thanked the council for supporting the project as it would give food for thought and pleasure to countless generations to come. Its location meant it would be visible daily to staff and students, but the college said it would make the work accessible to visitors and school groups through prearranged meetings. Sir Anthony said, I want this work to be something that the life of the college lives with and that, will, that, will, that it will be a continual source of questioning, of projection, a marker of an elusive relationship to a person in our evolving time. Hmm. Another good story is the gay French uh, prime minister, yes. Gabriel Attal, and I, let's look at a picture of him. He <coughs> says his uh, appointment shows the country's evolution. He just gave his first um, speech, um, and he says um, he's enjoying how much the country has evolved. The nation was tearing itself apart just 10 years ago over same-sex marriage, but being French in 2024 means being able to be prime minister and openly gay, he said in his first major address to parliament. This is proof of our country is, is our country is moving and mindsets are evolving, he told the National Assembly, which is the lower house of France's parliament. His orientation has caused barely a ripple in France, according to a news report, which notes that any criticism of the new prime minister has centered on him being a carbon copy of President Emmanuel Macron. <laughs> Macron appointed Attal as prime minister three weeks ago after Elizabeth Bourne resigned. He had been education minister, a post in which he was the most popular politician in France. And before that, he was minister of public works and public accounts. At 34, he is the youngest prime minister in modern French history. His former civil partner, Stéphane Sejourn, was recently named foreign minister as Macron reconfigured his cabinet. In a speech to the National Assembly, Atal pledged to support farmers who have been protesting over declining incomes. He promised financial limits on food imports. He also said his government would urge employers to increase workers' pay and would tie unemployment benefits to requirements for job training and internships. Work should pay more than inactivity, he said. I don't know that I agree with that. But. <laughs> I love inactivity. <laughs> <laughs> he additionally said he would seek to recruit more doctors to France, take steps to address bullying in schools, reduce government bureaucracy, and try out a four-day work week. I could get behind that for his yeah. administration's employees. To be French in 2024 is to live in a country that is seeking stability, justice, and peace, he said. Good. One Do you have any headlines? Because we're going to, I am uh, I have a couple of things with pictures that I just wanted to do briefly. So do you have? Oh, sure. Yes. I only have two more, three more stories, but I'll just give you the headlines. The first gay yodeling choir has been established in Switzerland. And I have a picture before <laughs> of Franz Marcus Stedelman, who is uh, gay himself. 
And it's very, um, he said, yodeling has been going, you know, clubs have been active for 100 <laughs> years. You don't have to yodel. <laughs> you do, um, yodel a you. Uh, first, the first recur rehearsal occurred uh, in a yodeling club, only two of three singers yodel. Everyone else sings just like in choirs. So okay. they don't want to make a statement. They just want to yodel, they said. Um, an Italian court convicts parents of abusing a gay son. This is in Turin. It's very interesting. They may, not have, they may just have to go to a diversity uh, training session. But what they did to their son was awful. And finally, a psychiatrist refused to see him, saying that homosexuality isn't a disease. Um, and finally, the child psychologist got wind. They wanted to force him to have sex with the woman to prove he was a man. And the child psychologist stepped in and reported them. Um, and finally, uh, I have a picture before you of a retired priest, 80, who paid men for sex. Oh, I read about that. And was found murdered in bed. This was yeah. in Valencia. And they say that the person who murdered him was his Peruvian lover. And um, bad things, you know, he was strangled and so forth. Can I just do these two now? Yes. OK. <clears throat> I know, very, very quickly. Amber Glenn is a US women's figure skating champion. Here is a picture of her. Uh, it's her sixth US championship. Uh, Glenn's victory makes her first openly LGBT skater to win the US women's title. And here is her picture. And um, let's see. Um, I guess that's probably it. I, I had some. some um, we got the trivia coming. Well, I know. Trivia. OK, go. <laughs> the organization was Golden Threads. The founder, Christine Burton. You know, I'm really mad who, at myself that I didn't get that, because I knew that. Who lived in Burlington for years. And her comment is, you're never too old to love and be loved. Oh, so. very true. And on that note, does anybody uh, have anything else to say? We have 47 seconds. No? Shall we just go <laughs> on and say, resist. remember to resist. <laughs>